Well, good morning. It's so good to see each of you today. I was kind of wondering how many would show up with, uh, we got about 85 people over at, in next door taking the uh, financial peace experience, but we're so glad that all of you are here today. You're certainly, if all of you showed up, you must be the cream of the crop, right? Uh, so we're glad that you're here today. Today we're kicking off a brand new series called Construction Zone. I guess you might have kind of picked that up on the decorations today. Uh, Somebody said, where'd you steal all of those? <laughs> well, it kind of helps to be the mayor. <laughs> so uh, I pulled a few strings. But uh, today, the title of today's message is called Scope Creep. Scope Creep. Do you know what that is? Let me give you a definition. It's a, it's a construction term. And it literally means when... Scope creep is when continuous changes and modifications are made or when the work or the project grows uncomfortably beyond the original scope of the project. For example, have you ever built a house from scratch? Um, or maybe more relevant, have you ever engaged in a remodel project? Um, it's amazing how quickly the scope of a project and certainly the cost of a project can go well beyond what you've budgeted and probably well beyond what you can afford, especially as you make changes and you decide, well, we need to add this upgrade and this upgrade and that upgrade. Uh, take remodeling a kitchen, for example, which my wife decided not long ago we definitely needed to do at our house. So it started out real simple, just gonna make a few changes and, but then as we went along, of course, the cabinets, these really nice oak stained cabinets are outdated now. They need to be painted white. So all of those had to come off the walls. They all had to be painted white. And of course, now when you get that done, now you gotta have new countertop, now you gotta have new floors, now you gotta have new appliances. And it just, like a mushroom, it just grows. And it goes well beyond what you originally planned for and budgeted. This is what you call scope creep when something goes beyond what you planned for. Well, isn't that true in relationships? Especially in marriage and parenting and really basically all relationships. You know, most people get married thinking that after they say I do, they're going to live happily ever after. <laughs> uh, but they soon discover that a meaningful relationship is costly. It, 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 it's a whole lot more than most of us anticipated and it gets bigger and bigger and it's very demanding and challenging and they literally have to work on it all the time. And in order for two people to actually become one, it takes a lifetime. And it takes a lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of energy, far more than most of us originally anticipated or thought. You know, much sooner than anticipated, certainly much sooner than we want, you know, dealing with change and dealing with issues can create a lot of stress in relationships. And stress invariably leads to conflict. And conflict leads to more stress, which leads to more conflict, more hurt, more misunderstanding, and more conflict. And Relationships, marriage especially, and family life is certainly a perfect example of what I would call scope creep. So there are three areas that I want to talk about today. I call them stress points. These three stress points can create a lot of stress uh, in relationships, and they're things that you just don't work on once, you'll work on the rest of your relationship. And there are things that just keep coming up because life keeps changing. The first stress point that we need to deal with that is a constant in a relationship, especially a marriage, are what I call unexpected differences. You know, every relationship has unexpected differences. And if you're gonna have a successful, satisfying, meaningful marriage, 
you have to work on your differences. You've got to understand that there are differences between you and your spouse, between you and your children, or, or whoever. They're, they're just a common stress issue in all relationships. For example, one of the biggest complaints that I hear all the time is, you know, I just don't understand this, this, this man that I married, or I don't understand this woman that I married. Uh, she just doesn't make sense, or I can't figure him out, or I don't know why she acts the way she does. I don't know why he does the things that he does. Well, that's part of life. You know, we're all different, and, and these unexpected differences create stress, and they'll either bring you closer together or they will drive you further apart. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 talks about this issue. He says, no one can really know what anyone else is thinking or what he is really like except that person himself. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. Have you ever said to a spouse, well, I know what you're thinking, or have your spouse say to you, well, you should have known that. You should have known how I felt. And you're sitting there with a blank look in your face saying, well, I'm, I'm sorry. I just missed it. I didn't know how you felt. Well, you should have known my thoughts. You should have known. You know, we say that all the time. But the truth is, unless you're God, you really don't know what someone is thinking. Now, we, we say, well, you know, I can read him or I can read her like a book. You know, we've been married for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, ever how long, you know, I can read them like a book. Well, you may be able to have an idea about certain things or certain things you think, you know, someone you've been with for a long time is thinking, but unless they tell you what they're thinking, you can't read somebody's mind. Nobody can do that. That's why communication, honest communication, sometimes painful communication, is absolutely essential to having a meaningful relationship. It's important that we share what we're thinking. We share our feelings um, because you're different. I mean, you do realize that. You do realize that your spouse is different from you. I mean, you don't think alike. You don't act alike because you're different. You know, when my wife and I got married, I had no idea how profoundly different we were. Before we got married, I thought we were, gosh, we were just alike. She would say, I like that. And I'd say, oh, I like that too. And she would point something out and I'd say, oh, wow, I like that also. I mean, we have so much in common. And it was amazing before we got married, all the things I thought we had in common. What was the big discovery was after we said I do and after we got married, I began to realize how different we were. We had far more things that we were different in than we were in common with. Yeah, and I think when God looks at certain people getting married, I think God calls the angels over and says, hey guys, come look at this. This, this couple's fixed to get married. This is going to be a ride. This is going to be a, this is going to be a blast watching them. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just amazing how different we are. Those differences can create stress and conflict. For example, most couples have such differences like this. You know, one is an early riser. I mean, you're a morning lark and the other person's a night owl. I mean, one wakes up singing zippity doo dah and the other doesn't even wake up until noon. Uh, one of you is daring and impulsive, and the other is cautious and reserved. One of you says, well, you know, I play by the rules, and the other person says, well, man, let's, why, let's just make up the rules as we go along. Let's be spontaneous. One of you is neat and organized and structured, and the other person is totally disorganized, flexible, laid back, and basically a disorganized slob. Uh, one of you is always on time. Matter of fact, for some of you, on time is 10 minutes before the appointed time, at least. And for the other person, they have never been on time in their entire life. You know, just getting there is called on time for them. One of you loves to talk, and the other person is a deaf mute. Uh, one of you loves to cuddle, and the other person is a porcupine. Uh, when it comes to sex, one of you says, let's drop everything. And the other one says, drop dead. <laughs> kind of like the guy who went home after church. 
and he handed his wife two aspirin, and she said, what's that for? He said, it's for your headache. She said, I don't have a headache. He said, gotcha. <laughs> you know, the fact is, we're all unique, and we're all different. Differences aren't wrong. They just create conflict. They, now, they can also be the spice of a relationship, you know, because you are different when you learn how to handle them properly and wisely. Matter of fact, if handled wisely, differences can bring balance into each other's lives because all of us need balance and all of us are out of balance in certain areas and God, I believe, brings couples together with their differences so we can balance and complement each other. And the truth is we need each other even though we're totally different. Those differences can help produce growth in our relationships, in our personal lives, if we let them. That's the reason the Bible says things like this. In 1 Peter 3, verse 7, men, are you listening? It says, men, husbands, you should try to understand the wife you live with. Could I go back and read that again? (laughs) Husbands, you should try. You need to circle that word, try. You gotta work at it, I mean, try. I mean, understanding your partner takes effort. It takes time. Matter of fact, it may take the rest of your life. Uh, And that's why you need God in your life. That's why you need God in a relationship. Because God wants to help you, he will help you. God will give you the wisdom, the power, and the strength to understand the depth of your mate's differences. And, you know, we need God's help, you know, because we're so different, we need a source stronger than us to help us understand, accept, and learn from those differences. For example, we're different biologically. That ought to be obvious. Now, that's getting very confusing in today's culture. We got men that don't know their men and women that don't know their women or women who think they're men and men who think they're women. I mean, it's a, the culture is so crazy today. Uh, I won't get on that, but uh, we are different incredibly biologically, and there are so many things we could talk about, just the biological difference between men and women that creates who we are as well as the dynamic and the differences uh, that can create conflict in a relationship. We're also different psychologically. Would you agree that men and women think differently? And one of the assumptions that we all tend to make is men often assume in trying to understand, you know, their wife, men tend to assume that women think like men. (laughs) And women often assume men think like women because we try to understand each other on how we understand ourselves. I mean, have you ever played this game? The wife says, well, now that's not what I meant. And he said, well, well, what, what did you mean? She said, well, well, you ought to know what I mean. <laughs> and he said, well, no, I don't, I, I don't get it. And, and, and the truth is he probably, ladies, doesn't have the least idea what you meant. And it happens both ways. That's why it's so important that we share with each other what we think, that we share with each other how we feel and what made us feel this way because we are both different psychologically, we think different. For example, uh, one of you loves to spend money, and you bet I, most of you probably married a tightwad, if that's the case. Uh, that's why financial peace is so important, and that's why I encourage everybody to go through Financial Peace University. Uh, it, it, it allows you to sit down, see your differences, plan a budget together, agree on a, agree on a spending plan together, agree on a giving plan, a savings plan, a spending plan, It helps you to take your differences and find common ground, and that's what's so good about financial peace and why it makes such a big difference in so many marriages when they go through it, because we're different in the way we think. Get it? We're not only different biologically, we're not only different psychologically, we are different experientially. Uh, All of us were raised with life experiences the way we were raised by our parents, uh, what the values that we were taught were unique to us. And so here we got two different people who were 
raised differently that creates conflict often in a relationship or stress. I, I've told this before, I'm telling it again. Um, when I first got married to my wife, I was raised, when I would come home, my mom would have dinner sitting on the stove and because you know I, I was doing this and doing that in sports, so it would be ready and I would just come in, fix it and eat and leave. Sometimes on weekends we would eat together, but we just kind of did our own thing uh, during the week. Well, my wife came from a very structured home environment. Whenever they had a meal, the family always sat down together and they ate the meal together. And so that created just a little bit of a conflict after we got married because my wife, when she fixed a meal, she expected me to be there on time and to sit down and to eat the meal together. And so that was such an irritation for her because I, I was just raised differently. I just thought it was no big deal. You know, I'll eat it when I get there, honey. And, and, uh, and I would always say, I'm coming. And of course, I'm coming usually meant 30, 40 minutes, an hour later. And so and she, was, she kept trying to explain how frustrating that was to her. She, I worked on this meal, I expect you to be there. So I came home one day, the table's cleaned up, there's nothing out. There's nothing on the stove. I said, where's my, my dinner? She said, it's in the trash. I said, what do you mean it's in the trash? So I went and looked in the trash. Not just my dinner, my plate, my silverware. The... <laughs> she threw everything in the trash. And uh, after that, I worked a little more diligently at getting there. on time Because we were just raised differently. And that tends to create conflict. Uh, and so those are things you work on. When you work on them and you, and you realize how each of you are wired up and how each of you were brought up and you work on it, you understand it and you receive it. And sometimes if you compromise on both sides a little bit, it, it, it can make your relationship much stronger. That's the reason the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 24, verse three. He says, by wisdom, a house is built and through understanding, it is established. I mean, it takes wisdom and it takes understanding to build meaning, helpful, lasting relationships. Um, listen to what James chapter one, verse five says. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, call up Jerry Springer. <laughs> oh, that's not what it says, does it? Or oh, it doesn't say to you guys either, if you, if you need wisdom, Marriage counsel, don't go down to the bar and talk to your bar buddies who are working on their second and third marriage. He says, if you lack wisdom, who should you ask? You should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. There's two things that will help you gain wisdom. The first thing you need to do is you need to read your Bible. The best manual on relationships that has ever been written is the Bible. And the Bible is filled with all kinds of guidelines and insights and wisdom on how to build a meaningful, lasting relationship. Read your Bible and you realize, here's stuff I need to work on all the time. And then when you read your Bible, pray. God, I just read something. Boy, I really need to work on this. Especially when you read Galatians and Ephesians when it talks about relationships and how we ought to treat our spouses and, and how we ought to love each other unconditionally and, and be giving. You read that and you realize God's word is filled with counsel that I need to work on the differences in our relationship. So you read and you pray a lot. Get it? Not only do we have the the stress point of, of uh, unexpected differences. The second stress point is what I call unmet needs. You know, marriage was God's idea. God designed marriage. He designed every aspect of marriage. And he designed it so that a man and a woman would mutually benefit each other and would seek to live for each other and to meet each other's relational needs, emotional needs, and spiritual needs. Uh, it is our responsibility once you enter into a marriage to live for each other, and then to live that out in front of your children so that ultimately 
they can see a, one of the best things you can do for your kids is, is to love each other and, and, and to work on a strong marriage. And, and then hopefully they can repeat some of that when they, when they get married. Here's what 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3 says. A man should fulfill his duty as a husband. Now, what is his duty? Well, that, that can be a whole lot of stuff. This says, and a woman should fulfill her duty as a wife, and each should satisfy the other's needs. You see that word satisfy? Each, each of you have basic physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual needs that only a husband or a wife can meet, and God brought you two together so that you could meet those needs in each other, and it's your duty to do that. God's plan is that you live for each other, that you live for the other person and, you, and that you don't live for yourself. Uh, God will help you live for each other. That's why you need his help. It's kind of like the couple who went to see a marriage counselor and, and the wife refused to talk to her husband and she refused to talk to the counselor. As they kept going week after week, the counselor kept trying to get the wife to open up, but nothing worked. Finally, on about the seventh or eighth visit, the counselor is frustrated. He gets up, he walks over to the lady, and he just picks her right up and hugs her and gives her a great big wet kiss right on the mouth. And she smiled, and she lit up, and she was so excited, she reached over and hugged her husband. And the counselor looked at the husband, he said, Mr. Jones, that kiss represents the kind of treatment your wife needs every day. And the husband said, well, doc, you know, I can bring her on Monday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, but I'm not sure about the rest of the week. Now, I know that's a corny story. You've probably heard it many times before. But isn't that typical of the human mentality? You know, we just don't get it sometimes, especially some of us men. I mean, I'm speaking from my own experience. I mean, it's like, you know, my wife and I, we're, we are on different wavelengths. And meeting the needs of your spouse is a skill that doesn't come naturally you have to learn and grow and develop that skill. It's not automatic. And just because you got married does not mean that you know how or you will immediately learn how to meet the needs of your wife or your husband. The truth is you'll spend the rest of your life because as you get older, your, your needs change. When you have kids, your needs change. When you have certain job responsibilities, your need change, and you're constantly dealing with all of these changes that create new needs in a relationship. And what it does, it ought to make you aware of what the, the number one problem is in relationships. Do you know what the number one problem is in relationships? It's not money. It's not sex. The number one problem in relationships is selfishness. We're very self-centered people. It's part of our human nature, and it's part of what the culture tells us to do. Now, ha have you noticed how quickly your focus shifts after you get married? It's, it's, it's amazing. You know, while we're dating, what we're doing is we're trying to win that person's affection. And so it's amazing the things that we'll do and the things that we'll like and to go along with and agree to and, and the extra things that we'll do to try and win that person over. But then just as soon as we get married, we slowly forget those things. I mean, we worked hard at winning the relationship and now we think we've got it. Now we think we've got it for the rest of our life. And, and that's why so many people end up in divorce court. It's because our focus of living for each other shifts Listen to what God says about our focus in marriage, what it should be, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. He says, look out for each other's interest, not yours. Look, beyond, look out for the other person's interest, not just your own. How do you do that? I mean, I mean that, that contradicts culture. The culture says, take care of yourself. The culture says, get all you can, can all you get, sell and live and poison the rest. You know, one of the statements that I, I've, I've heard it till I'm sick of hearing it. Somebody says, well, I just got to do what's best for me. That kind of thinking doesn't come from God. 
And you won't find it taught not in one verse in the Bible, not when it comes to relationships. Our attitude of what can I do that's best for you? Even though our culture is totally contrary. And, and it also conflicts with human nature. You know, human nature is basically self-centered. If I were to take my smartphone here and take my camera, which I'm doing right now, and I'm going to take some pictures. Smile, you ready? All right, got a pretty wide lens. Okay. Now let's say I take these pictures and I send them, text them to each of you, the pictures that I just took. What is the first thing I can guarantee that most of you are going to look for? What are you going to look for? You're going to look for us. You're going to look. Well, there I am. I'm that little black dot right over there in the corner. And if that little black dot looks pretty good, then the whole picture looks good, doesn't it? I mean, everybody else could be sitting there picking their nose and spinach in their teeth, but if you look good, the picture looks good. Well, that's just human nature. Human nature is very self-centered. And that's what you got to understand about relationships, because there's there are two laws of reality you need to learn. The first law is that you married an imperfect person. Amen? Amen. Number two, the second law is that you're not so hot yourself. You're, you're broken too. And when two broken, imperfect people get married, guess what? They do dumb, broken stuff. They end up hurting each other. They end up causing stress and conflict. Even though you love somebody, you're going to do dumb things. You're going to hurt their feelings, even when you've been together for years. And so that's the reason it's so important that you deal with this last stress point. The last stress point is this. You've got to deal regularly with unforgiven mistakes. Unforgiven mistakes. When two imperfect people get married, they hurt each other. They make mistakes. And you can either rub it out or you can do what most couples do and they rub it in. Unforgiveness will literally kill a relationship. It will destroy a marriage. Here, listen to what Ephesians chapter 4 verses 31 through 32 says. He says, let all bitterness Wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking, let it be put away. Get rid of it. With all malice, get rid of all the hate. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted. And that word forgiving means constantly forgiving one another. And how can you do that? By focusing on just as God in Christ has forgiven you and forgives you and continues to forgive you and forgive you. Forgive. Work on for, you got to work on forgiveness your whole life because we're different. We have unmet needs, and we make mistakes. And the Bible says, forgive. Don't hold on to your hurts. And some of you are doing that right now, and it's destroying you. And it, uh, here's, here's the terrible thing about holding on to, to unforgiveness. It will end up doing more damage to you than it does the person that you are directing your unforgiveness and your bitterness toward. And what's really sad about unforgiveness is that it will spill over into other relationships that you don't want it to spill, that have nothing to do with the conflict. Because it's like a virus. It just infects everything around it. And that's why it's so important that you let, especially some of you I know may be dealing with a major, I mean a really, really big hurt. And if you are and you aren't able to work through it, you and the other person, you may need to go get some good, strong Christian counseling and sit down with a good Christian counselor and let them help you work through a major hurt. Um, because you need to do it God's way. Maybe you heard about the lady who went to see her pharmacist. And she said to the pharmacist, she says, I, I need to buy some arsenic. 
And the pharmacist said, why do you need arsenic? And she said, because I want to kill my husband. And he said, what? She said, you heard me. I want to kill my husband. And the pharmacist says, why on earth would you want to do that? She said, because my husband is having an affair with your wife. And the pharmacist said, well, why didn't you tell me you had a prescription? (laughs) You know, unforgiveness will make you do unnatural things. And they'll make you very unpleasant. And it will spill over into every relationship in your life. There's something about keeping score that will kill relationships, and especially a marriage. You've got to let go of your hurts and get help if you need help doing that. Get it? You say, but you don't understand, the hurt is so deep. Well, let me give you one suggestion. That scripture that I just shared with you from Ephesians goes on to say, he says, and be kind to one another, tender heart, forgive one another, just as Christ, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. One of the things that certainly helps me to be more forgiving is when I realize how much God has forgiven me. When I realize how much I've hurt God, when I realize how much I've often offended my Lord, and when I realize that he loves me unconditionally even though I disappoint him, heard him do dumb things over and over again, God loves me and he loves you unconditionally. And he says, you gotta let it go because I've let it go. You gotta forgive. And sometimes when I feel unforgiving, I need to be reminded that I've been forgiven and that makes me more forgiving. Get it? That's why it's so important that you pray about your hurt and your feelings and you go to God's word for guidance and you ask God for wisdom and understanding. So how are you doing in this area? Let me ask especially those of you that are married or maybe of any kind of relationship you got going in your life is important. It could be parenting, kids. It could be, you know, a, a dating relationship. Matter of fact, I got a scale on a scale of one being absolutely terrible all the way to 10 being absolutely heaven, how would you rate yourself, not your relationship, but how would you rate how you are doing when it comes to dealing with differences, when it comes to meeting needs, when it comes to forgiving? Would you say, well, I'm doing really good. I'm just doing fantastic. I'm forgiving. I work hard on meeting my, you know, the other person's needs. Uh, man, I'm, I've got a nine or a 10 going here. Give yourself a number, okay? Or if you say, well, you know, my marriage is good, but there's certainly room for growth, then maybe give yourself a, a seven or an eight. Or if you say, well, you know, my marriage is hurting. It's hurting really bad. You know, we, I've got some issues that need to be confronted and resolved. Then maybe you need to give yourself a four or a five. Or if you say, boy, my, mar- my marriage needs a miracle. They may be rated a one, two, or three. Now, I'm talking about how you, now here's what I want to encourage. If you really got some courage and you're really going to pray and have a good attitude about it, when you get home, does everybody got a number in your head now? You got a number? Got a number? How you, you rating yourself? When you say, get, get home, look at your spouse and say, well, what was your number? Well, I'll tell you if you tell me yours. <laughs> And just share it and then talk about it. Don't just get angry and fuss and, and hurt and, and angry over your perception. Just say, well, why do you feel that way? And engage in what the Bible calls communication. And maybe pray a little bit. God, help me to see life from my partner's perspective. Help me to feel what he or she is feeling. God, help me to understand why they feel that way. And rather than you trying to justify it and argue it down, just say, well, I'll receive that. And I'm going to pray about it and work on that. And then you share your perspective. You know, marriage is important to God. It's important to our church. That's why we've gone to all this effort to talk about it in a series. Uh, Marriage and relationships and families are so important. God wants you to have a strong marriage. He wants you to have a strong family. 
but it doesn't just happen by coincidence. You have to work on it. And listen, it takes three people to build a strong marriage and a strong family. It takes you, your spouse, and who else? It takes God. If you're trying to build a strong relationship without God, you're, you're sitting on a two-legged stool, and I promise you, you're going to fall over. And that's why you need God's power in your life. Listen to this verse as I close. Ephesians 1, verses 19 and 20. He says, I pray that as a Christian, you will begin to understand how incredibly great God's power is to help those who believe him. It is that same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in heaven. The most powerful event that ever occurred in history was the resurrection. That's why we, we're Christians. The power that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead. He says that same power, that resurrection power, can resurrect dead feelings. It can resurrect a dead marriage. It can re resurrect a, a dead family relationship, parents and children. It really can make a difference because God loves you. He loves you just the way you are, and he wants to help you where you are to get to where you need to go. And that's why you need to read the Bible regularly, you need to pray regularly, and you need to do that with your family, and especially your spouse. Let's bow our heads together. First of all, those of you that answered that question on where you're at, the truth is we all need to work on something. Certainly some of us have bigger issues we need to work on, but all of us need to work because none of us are perfect. Could I encourage those of you that are Christians to make a fresh commitment of your heart and your life and every relationship in your life, especially that of your family. Make a fresh commitment of yourself to God and that relationship. Do it right now. Just say, oh God, I make a fresh, new commitment today to become the man or the woman, the father, the, the mother, the husband, the wife, that God, you have created me to be. God, help me to become the godly son or daughter that God, I need to be. God, I know I can't do it. Not what needs to be done without your strength. And God, I commit myself to you right now, afresh and anew. And Lord, I pray that your resurrection power would flow into my heart, flow into my mind, help me to think differently, and help give me the strength to act differently. And God, when I, I'm looking at a relationship that I'm struggling with, God, would you just remind me of everything you've done for me and how much you forgive me and love me and, and have patience with me and so much that you went to a cross and died for me. May that help motivate me and encourage me to go the second mile and to do what you would want me to do, what would bring honor to you. In your name I pray. If, you're, if you are not a Christian, could I encourage you to make a commitment of your heart and life to Christ today? You can't do this without his strength. Could you pray something like this, Lord? Thank you for dying on a cross for me. And God, I need you in my life. I want you in my life. I invite you into my life today to take over. And as best I know how, I want you to be the Lord of my life and I invite you to do that and start working in me and through me today. And Lord, I, I wanna begin this journey of walking with you. So thank you, Lord, for forgiving my sins. Thank you for changing my heart. Help me to understand this commitment better. But I'll not be ashamed that I have committed my heart and life to you. I'll share it. In your name I pray. And all of God's people said, if you, especially if you prayed that sinner's prayer today and committed your life to Christ, I just want to remind you the Christian life is a journey. And it's a journey that God doesn't want you to take by yourself. You need other people in your life. And we'd like to help you 
take the next step. The first step is committing your life to Him. The next step in this journey is getting connected with some truth and some other believers that will help you to grow. So will you please take a connection card out of the back of the seat before you leave if you prayed the sinner's prayer today, invited your life, Christ, your life and uh, committed your life to Christ today. Just say, I prayed the prayer. Give us your name, phone number, and address, and we'll contact you and help you take the next step. And we'll send you some information in the mail the, that'll show you some opportunities you can, uh, that'll help you on this journey. Get it? God bless you. Thank you for being here today.